Our next reading comes from the faculty and staff minutes from Friday, February 16th, 1996. Financial report. Reported on a financial situation. Next key point. Lloyd is investigating the possibilities of CLBI entering the internet. I had this on my door for like a month getting ready for that, yeah. So, His girls were singing. It's good. In 1986 or 87, I drove out with my family uh, to Camrose to bring my sister to CLBI. We poked our heads into Messiah, and the sanctuary was a complete mess. Come on, Messiah, get it together. There were pipes everywhere. <laughs> it was just being assembled. Anyway, I remember that. I remember that. Well, I was a student at CLBI. Guess where I sat? Where I sat today. Remember this? For many years, these were the CLBI pews. You know, it changed around, but, you know, the first few rows were filled with, with Bible school students. And the Lutheran landscape has changed in cameras, and it will continue to change but for many, many years, you know, that's where, that's where they were. You know, there were many churches, but a lot of them were there. I remember Arlen Salty, when he was speaking here, is like, yeah, I was sitting right around there, right where Alvin is. When he was there, Arnold Hagen was preaching, and that was a moment where Jesus got his full attention, and he came running back to Jesus. God has moved in this place in powerful ways, and he's not done moving. So pop quiz. So CLBI was founded in 1932. Where was Messiah located? Over there? Over there? Think so? Okay. I was asking some people as I came in, you know, was it, you know, by the subway, the Pentecostal church, the extra foods, the vinettes? Anyway, we got history, okay? Uh, over there, now, which is now the Performing Arts Center. I think that's where it was. I think that's where it was. There was no dates on the pictures downstairs. I want to go look. So, but there. You see, I have a letter from the archives to read. Next letter. January 24th, 1933. Okay, this is CLBI's first year. And this is a letter, it actually came from my house. Uh, this is a letter written by Judith Severed, my wife's uh, grandmother, to her boyfriend, Magnus Johnson. It reads, Mr. Magnus Johnson, both. So, very first year. I've thought, dear Magnus Johnson, I have thought several times to write you, and I've been almost too busy to write letters. How's both? I suppose it is just the same as ever. Skip down a bit. Well, now I'm going to uh, tell you about what I've been doing. Uh, there has been about 70 students at the Bible school. They're all such a, a nice bunch. We have no school in the afternoons. We have breakfast at 7.30 at the church. Over there. Okay, so the, the school was located in, in the central agency's parking lot. Okay, that was where they first started. They rented that school from the city. And breakfast was served at, and they stayed in homes, people's homes from the church, from Camrose Lutheran. Okay, that's what you were called, okay? And um, at 7.30 at the church, and then school starts at 8.30. And we're out at 12.30, miraculous. That's the same schedule we keep today. <laughs> Just crazy. And then we have dinner. I'm almost starved by the time dinner time comes. The teachers give us plenty of studying. I hardly uh, ever get to get before get to bed before 11 o'clock. Sometimes I get so sleepy that I go to bed at 8. Only I wish you were here to enjoy the fun. <sighs> yeah. Well, I think I must close now and go to bed. Yep. Annie is sleeping soundly, and I, and I will be too if I don't crawl into bed pretty quick. So, good night. Hope to hear from you again. <gasps> Judith. So, Magnus is actually... Uh, he crawled around up here in helping to assemble the beams and stuff like that. So Lloyd Johnson was their boy, Lloyd and Sonia. Sonia's my, my wife's mom. 
So it's kind of fun. Yes, it is important to look back and celebrate, to set up memory stones, recognize how God has moved. This city has a very deep and spirit, significant spiritual heritage. Enoch Scottvold, he was a convert to Christ in the 1920s, and uh, he started what was called Camrose Week. And these were like evening revival services, and there was a service across the street from where City Hall is. And that became a model of how to do evangelistic outreach, which the Lutheran evangelistic movement learned from. And then it spread from here like wildfire. Thousands and thousands of people to the LEM Deeper Life events. And it started on the soil here in Cameron. So we need to recognize that, that this, this is, a, is, this is a, a holy city. You know, God has moved here in tremendous ways. CLC was the high school, and then CLBI was the Bible school, and then eventually it became a college, and it went on from there. So if you go into the, the uh, history book, the history pictures in Augustana, it is a picture, and one of the, the, the deans of CLBI is actually teaching, Vinji in those pictures there by the library. Yeah. It's like a, a rock being thrown into a lake and the ripples go out from it. Those concentric circles have been, can be felt for decades. So thank you for taking me in when I was 20 to be youth director here. They gave me an office. And, uh, and I was like, an office? <laughs> a filing cabinet? I'm here to do like youth ministry, like, you know, like tell kids about Jesus and eat pizza and step all night. And so anyway, I did sleep in that office sometimes. Yes, it was good. At that time when I was there, Cam Harder was on staff and Val Hennig, Pastor Bonnie. And uh, Cam told me a story that in the late 80s, the high school would call Messiah to find out what time their confirmation class was so that they could schedule their basketball practices. Just let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> Times have changed, haven't they? And, uh, you know, that was kind of the glory days of, you know, the history of Messiah and stuff. But, you know, we were just, okay, society was going in the church's direction. It was like, you know, there was momentum there, and you just went with it. Well, things have changed, haven't they? Things have changed. CLBI, we rode that wave as well. And CLBI, we sent out church leaders, pastors, missionaries, equipped lay people to live out the gospel in their daily lives. In the 80s, 70s, CLBI was just booming. We bought out the whole city block. Growth was everywhere. And in, in the 1980s, interest rates went north, and enrollment went south. Ah, panic. And there were six LBI schools, and they started folding because they had done the same thing. And then we eventually sold part of the block to the Bethany Group, where there's Hillside. And uh, yeah, and for years, for 15 years, the board and the staff were given buckets because the CLBI ship kept on taking water on water. And it was just like, it was, is it going to make it? Is it going to make it? Bev was on staff in those times too. Well, I confess that as president of the Bible school, sometimes I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know? You know what I'm saying? Have you experienced that in your life too? You're like, oh no, what's going to happen? There's something that's going to happen. I confess that many times my heart is full of fear of the unknown. Those who have served on staff and on the board, thank you. Thank you to those who have given when they even wondered, is the school going to make it? I, I want this Bible to continue. Thank you. Thank you. I love telling John Stoley's story when he, sp when he spoke to, and when he was in grade 11, spoke to Daryl Rosti, and he said, okay, I hear CLBI is going to close. Should I drop out of high school and go to Bible school right now? Because I want to go. So I'm glad that you didn't drop out of school, John. I'm glad you became a lawyer and continued on. But it was good to have you at CLBI. In January of this year, do you remember January? It was a dark January. And I hit a low. Got COVID. My dog died. My wife turned 50. That was her low. <laughs> and uh, my car got written off. It was just bad. 
And uh, CLBI, we had five, six second year students, and we weren't sure how many it was going to be one returning and enrollment. We were like, are we going to have enough students next year? And it's like, God, 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 what are we to do? And am I to, and I was praying, God, do I, do I recommend to the board? It's time. Shut her down. No church or ministry should assume they must exist until Christ returns. It's about a mission. The models change. The models change. They're only buildings. The gospel is timeless. The models change. And now we're in a seismic shifting time of change. Anyway, fearful times. And sometimes um, I can feel disqualified. Oh, Look at Abraham. We read that reading, you know, full of faith. Just looks at the stars. Let's do it. He's living in a foreign land in tents. I feel like that's kind of like where the church is right now. But full of faith, going straight ahead. By faith, when called to a place he would later receive as inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign land, living, living in tents. He seemed like his... Faith never wavered. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. I've also read the scriptures. I've read the other stories about Abraham as well. He wasn't always so full of faith. Going into new community. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's not my wife. That's my sister. Oh, I don't think God's going to provide an heir. Hagar, where are you? You know, like there's different things going on. He wasn't, you know, it wasn't always this banner full of, of faith. He... he he struggled. And I've read the history books of CLBI, Arnold Hagen, one night, just in his office, just like, ugh, what's going to happen? And at that point, for Arnold, it was kind of funny. He, the phone rang, and someone just called and just read him scripture and hung up late at night at CLBI. It was just these moments. Yeah. When I read the scriptures, there's a mix of faithful responses and fearful responses. The psalm today is a gift. And Psalm 43, 3, it was just in that. Send out your light and your truth, let them lead me. That is on the cornerstone. It's hidden in the bushes of the old CLBI building, but that's, that's the verse that's on the cornerstone. Okay? Send out your light and your truth, let them lead me. It's a way forward. God, you are my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Why are, do I have students coming? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar, altar of, of God. To God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre. Oh God, my God, my soul, soul. Why are you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put, put your hope in God, for yet I will praise him, my Savior and my God. This is the Christian experience. This is Jesus' prayer book. This is what teaches us how to pray. So in those times, and you know, all of us will be in different parts where we're going through hard stuff, we look to the scriptures and we can cry out to God, um, and he will meet us. God will rescue us. God desires to be our stronghold. We are people of the cross. The cross reveals our weaknesses. The cross is Jesus naked dying. And those parts when we feel like, ugh, I don't like how my life is going. No, in those moments, Jesus desires to meet you, to touch your life. When we feel broken, that is a chance for the gospel to go even deeper. And oh, I want to run away. I always want to live in victorious Easter Sunday, but the tears of the cross of Good Friday, they're equally strong and, and needed to feel that. So when we experience fear in our hearts, our sinful nature and the devil cry out, see, God isn't there. Who are you to think that God can work through you? See, you're a fraud. You're just pretending. You know, those are the lies that kind of run through my head. And I have to type them out in my journal, and I say, these are lies and then I write the truth. Jesus loves me. He meets me. In my baptism, I've been declared righteous. I've died with Christ. I've risen with Christ. 
I'm victorious with Christ. Hallelujah. So what remains for CLBI? About six years ago, um, the call came to, uh, to be the president of CLBI. And at that time, I prayed, God, are you done? At that time, I was praying, should we celebrate the 85 years through a big party and say it's done and now it's time for a death and a resurrection because there's something new coming? That was my honest prayer. And at a confirmation retreat at Hastings, as I was praying, right in my journal, just a peace came and it was just like God saying, no, I'm not done. I'm like, okay, what do you want to do? And, uh, and then just, you know, dreams came, visions came, enthusiasm came. I'm like, oh, God, I think this is a calling. And that's what moved me to take this position and to be the, as I say with our staff, we're stewarding a movement, a, a vision of this as we go forward. And the call came to make disciples, to make disciples in a way that can be in this foreign land and figure out how to build the church again and to be the church. In January 2022, I was asking the same question. And as I brainstormed and prayed with my staff and with my students and asked them, is God done? Is this model, has it run its course? Do we need to shift and be obedient to the Spirit of God? Because the mission must keep going. Let's not be stuck in our buildings. It's not about a monument. It's about a movement. But we love monuments, don't we? But it's about the movement. I was brainstorming with Shalane, one of my, she was my prayer coordinator, coordinator the past year. Yes, we have someone on staff and their job is to pray. Isn't that awesome? I have, um, I had about nine short-term staff members this past year. They work for 12 hours a week and exchange a room and board and they, they go to schooling at Augustana or online. It's awesome. They're discipling the students. We're discipling them. They're helping us out at various places on campus from the food to prayer or whatever it is. And so I'm talking with Shalane in my office. I'm like, Shalane, if all I gave you is the vision, the mission to make disciples of young adults, to disciple them and equip them for ministry, ground them in the Bible, helping them to fall in love with the church, to do God's work. Oh, and by the way, you have a campus. And what would you do? If you looked at my whiteboard, and she's like, you know what, young adults, they crave Christian community. Is there a way, Dean, that we could have, even from some students here that aren't studying at CLBI, but they could be discipled here? I think you might be onto something. For years, it's been like, well, if you're a student at CLBI, we'll disciple you. Or, oh, you're going, you want to go to university right away? Sorry, see you later. And so we actually, this year, we're doing an experiment I have one student coming who we're calling a community student. They'll be living in our dorms. They'll be in our discipleship groups. A staff member will be discipling them. They'll be in our chapel, but they won't be in our classes. They're going to be studying at another school. And so we'll have a mix, because so 50% of our discipleship is a classroom and 50% of it's in the dorm. So we're expanding what we do. It's fun. So anyway, I plant the seeds. Talk to me if you know someone who might be interested in something like that. Leverage the campus, leverage close Christian community, leverage great Bible teaching, make disciples. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assured about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So this sermon is about the future of CLBI. Charles Jackson shared about the, the past of CLBI. Pastor Harold Russ shared about kind of the present. And now here I am with my boots shaking. Is what's the future to look like? Where are we going? The post-pandemic CLBI. And the pandemic is a marker that we will recognize for the rest of our lives. Okay? We knew what we were doing. We went through it collectively. And over the next 20 years, we'll kind of see how the dust settles, how values have changed, how the church has changed. There's a major shift that happens, and we need to be flexible in, in, in where we go from here. And, there's, and challenges abound, and my heart is filled with fear. And like Abraham, oof, there were times when he let fear guide his decisions. But God is with us. So therefore, because God is with us, in the midst of uncertainty, 
we have a certainty that is not of this world. And in this, we need a posture of readiness. We need to trim our lamps and watch for our master's return. So when I go to a wedding and I come home, my wife and my daughters don't ask me, did you take any pictures of the groom? <laughs> Sorry, guys, you're just a token piece that's just standing there, okay? And so they want to see the bride. And, uh, but not with, so with the weddings of Bible times, eh? Watch for the groom to return back. Keep your lamps lit, as Jesus told us today. We need to be dressed and ready for service, keeping our lamps burning. And, uh, and our students, we try to equip them to be ready to go and to serve where opportunities come. So well done, Messiah, for flexing how you did youth ministry. And this is, there's a key principle in this. So instead of a one-size-fits-all youth ministry, they're like, okay, we've got some girls, we've got some guys, different age groups, different maturity levels. Okay, let's get some students to work with the guys, some students work with the girls, see how they go. And they, were, they just did life together and discipling them. And, and, and fruit comes. It's like Jesus is hanging out with Peter, James, and John and just seeing how it goes. So there's a principle there that any church can follow. God, who have you brought to us? Be faithful. Don't just try to get back to the glory days. Be faithful. How do we disciple who you've brought to us? So way to go. To be ready. To be ready. Tamara is here. Wave, Tamara. She's our impact director, which is our cross-cultural international trips. And so for the second year in a row, uh, International trips canceled. We almost got them out of the country. So we had to go, okay, Lord, what do we do? So we got our students and we sent them to the exotic metropolis of Red Deer <laughs> with Pastor Harold and Joyce Rust, who are always ready for a party to take people in. And their congregation, they are working with new Canadians, beautiful new Canadians, mostly from Africa. And so our students got to be there and help teach English help play with kids, visit with single moms, people that have raised their whole life in refugee camps, and they just fell in love with these people, and uh, it was wonderful. I went down to go visit them, and there's uh, a couple of my students just reading the Gospel of John with this beautiful Muslim man, and, uh, and lots of questions, it was great. And, uh, and now we have three of those students who are returning there to do a whole year with them at, in a, on an internship. My daughter's one of them, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be so good. But we've got to be ready to have this posture of readiness to go. There's a key book that we read, a key textbook. It's by Greg Finke. It's called Joining Jesus on His Mission, How to Be an Everyday Missionary. And there's a quote here. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Yeah, I heard a snicker over here because I quote it all the time. See, we've got to keep repeating these things. Jesus is on a mission. He is on a grand adventure to redeem and restore human lives to the kingdom of his Father. This is nothing new. Ever since he broke out of the tomb on Easter Sunday, Jesus has been on the loose, pursuing his redemptive mission, messing with people, ripening people, preparing people to be drawn back to the Father he loves. It is what he does. So Jesus is on the move in our community. He is. And we are discipling students in a way to be always curious, always watching to see how Jesus is going to show up in my neighbor's life, not just at church, but in my workplace, and to share that little nugget of Scripture, to ask a question, to help it to go deeper. Because a lot of people, they're kind of like, oh, yeah, I've been there, done that. I've been to church. I know that. i got a little bit of faith. But when people need to encounter Jesus, it's like that you know, on the road to Emmaus, our hearts were burning and they encountered Jesus. That is what we need today. So our vision going forward for the Bible school, it is a grand vision and it is easily dismissed because it doesn't seem grand. Kind of like what Jesus was doing. And here it is. It's to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. And to remember, I'm with you always. We are making disciples, grounding students in the Word and in the midst of community, having them experience the power of following Jesus. Great effort is placed on everyday tools that they will use so that discipleship is part of their everyday language and actions, a culture of discipleship. We model and teach the students to help individuals encounter the power of the gospel in a deeper way than they have before. And they know now how to ask discipling questions, to listen well, and to help people encounter the cross and the empty tomb in whatever situation they may be facing. This is one of the major differences in how we are discipling today and kind of before the pandemic. We've been 
figuring this out. This is a book called Seeking God's Face. It's just a daily office. It's just scripture. But we, just, we know how to be in the scriptures, seeing, okay, God, how are you getting my attention? And then how do I use God's word to disciple my neighbors, my coworkers, and just bring it in and see God do the heavy lifting? So before Sunday morning, this is how we did the heavy work of outreach. It was about Sunday morning. This will always be a precious part of my life, but this cannot do the heavy lifting of discipleship so much anymore. That one-on-one, -on -one, that encounter at the coffee shop, in the backyard, at the workplace, to disciple, to be watching, to be talking. Okay, That's, that is the difference. It doesn't sound like much, but it's everything. It's Jesus, he taught the, the crowds, but then he showed up at Zacchaeus' house. Hey, Zacchaeus, in the tree, get down, I'm coming to your house for lunch, okay? That's what he did. And then we send out our students and we support them in creating discipling communities where the, wherever the Spirit sends them. Some have a burden for their home church or for small country churches, so we'll coach them in that. Others are going to a university, and they're partnering with us to make disciples there. I've got some students who are returning this year because they have a burden for the local high school. I see you, Nathan. And uh, we're going to encourage them. It's like when Jesus sent out the 72. We're going to go. We're going to join Jesus on his mission. And God has given us a great campus. We're going to use it. So thank you for caring for that. We've been raising money to renovate the boys' bathroom. Yes! We've raised $36,000 so far. And so all gifts this weekend go towards that. It's kind of fun. It's a lot of fun. And the guys are very excited, even though they won't get to see it. You know, it'll be after. Yeah. Beautiful things are happening. I see God using CLBI to be a hub for an expanding, innovative discipling network. God is raising up leaders with the skills needed to make disciples wherever they end up. We are in uncharted territory. We are like Abraham living in the tents in a foreign land. It's scary, it's exciting, but knows, we know that those who are being sent have the skills, the heart, and the family network needed to thrive. And God is also using CLBI to support and fuel a movement of, of church-based discipleship, smaller discipling communities. These are places where, uh, where young adults come and gather, and they're shaping discipling communities. Some are just in beginning stages. Others have fleshed out full programs. Churches are supplying housing, training, facility, community, teaching, and there's young adults serving and fanning the flame of passion to follow Jesus. Um, in San Pedro, California, we'll be there. I bring our first-year students there in January. And um, at Trinity Lutheran of San Pedro, Pastor Nathan Hoff, he's got a bunch of interns that come together. Some of our students have gone. And they, they live in community there. And they eat their meals together. And they serve in the church. Some go to school, some work. But they're, they're just they're doing community at the Wimple headquarters in, in Minneapolis. The, the Wimple head, headquarters, their house, is a, is a discipleship house now. They're starting a program for young adults interested in going into missions. At uh, Mount Carmel, Minnesota, at a Bible camp there, they're starting a little discipleship program to help fan people you know, into mission, living in community. They're small discipling networks. And this is what we are trying to encourage and so we're in communication with churches and groups trying to do this and start trying to wrestle what this looks like in Hutchinson, Minnesota, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Sherwood Park, Alberta, San Pedro, California, Red Deer, Alberta, Alexandria, Minnesota, Outlook, Saskatchewan, even Wilderness Ranch, Renandale, BC, Sunfjord, Norway, Olympia, Washington, Queens, New York, Sakasane, New Jersey. God is on the move. This is the next wave. This is the next movement. These small micro communities that are flexible you don't need a $10 million campus to do it. You just need a house. You live together. They're discipled. We'll train you, we'll equip you, and we'll do this. There's cross-pollination happening now as communities are being established between these discipling communities. When I was just in Alexandria, Minnesota, I was in a house, and, and Lakin Beletsky's artwork was up in, the, in a house there. Lakin has been here, she's from Camrose. I'm just like, I'm in Minnesota. How did her artwork end up in your house? And she's like, oh, we met her in California when she was on internship. So it's just these connections are happening. People are meeting. It's good. It's very good. I'm almost done. I know it's a longer sermon, but 
I'm holding the pulpit hostage, Bev. Thank you, okay? And now we're reaching out even further. We need the global church to shape us. World Mission Prayer League is a key partner with us at the church. And we have uh, this past year, uh, Nijar and Niraj Eka, we're teaching. They're Wimpole staffers from Minneapolis, but they're, uh, they're from India. And, uh, and they're looking for students from India to come to CLBI. I have other people looking for other nations too, in Mongolia, other places. We need internationals to come here so we can teach them how to be a Christian. No, that they may come here to reignite our faith. And then we will go back, our students will go back with them to those nations to see what it looks like to be the church in a very unreached culture. Because that's what we need to learn from. And then we'll pay the bills. It's going to be awesome. It's good. So stay tuned on that one. So God's doing those things there. Uh, friends, we're honored to cheer on the next generation, praying, encouraging, speaking hope, giving generously, sharing stories. And God is bringing people to faith. There's this, this a young man who's coming this year, who came to faith recently, uh, unchurched background. His parents are like, what are you doing? And uh, a young man, a friend of his, is encouraging him to come to CLBI. He's like, ah, I can't afford to go. I have got some, maybe a few thousand saved up, but it's like 13 grand to go to Bible school. I can't afford to go. 13 grand is actually cheap, but he still couldn't afford it. And I'm like, all right, let me introduce you to the body of Christ. I know some people. I'll tell some friends. And I know people that would love to finance you coming to Bible school. It's like, they wouldn't do that. They don't know me. I'm like, as a Christian, this is your family. They will rally around you. So we have students like that, new believers who want to come to Bible school, but they don't know you. And if you're interested in that, talk to me. or Write student aid on the offering envelope, and we will bring these people into the body of Christ and raise up new leaders. So I confess that I've often put on the doom glasses and I see the world through that narrative. Those are not good times and the fears are real. But you also have pair, you also have doom glasses. Today we have heard God's word, we'll receive communion, and these are means of grace. Today Jesus enters into what we ever may, whatever we may be fearing and says, it's okay, I am here, and no matter what happens, I've got this, trust me. Even if it doesn't go the way you want, I'm here. And to our amazement, in those places, God creates faith. He gives us hope. And now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Can I have an amen? Amen.